Hello, everyone. Just wanted to give everyone an extra minute to log in. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to have a presentation um, from Kristen Hislop, but uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, just make sure if you're not already muted that um, you can mute yourself during the presentation. And uh, when you have questions, you can drop them into the chat box and Aaron and I'll review it at the end and we'll get to ask questions. And um, before we begin, I'll pass it over to Catherine for announcements. Hi, everyone. I am happy to see you tonight and hope you're doing well and staying healthy. I have a few brief announcements. First of all, thank you to CJ Oliverson and Joyce Carrasso for an excellent spring El Tecolote. You'll all be receiving it soon. I read a draft yesterday and was really impressed with the work of the CBC leaders, our community's participation and the 2022 birding data. We identified 194 species, so great job. Second of all, the February 25th bird walk and February 27th field trip to the Ventura duck ponds remain canceled. However, our bird walks and field trips will resume in March, so please check our website for updates. Third, please stay tuned for a grand opening at NCOS in May. We hope to see you there at the Audubon Overlook. Details to follow. Also, we are really excited to announce a new collaboration with the Santa Barbara Audubon Society and the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. In May, together we're going to celebrate World Migratory Bird Day and we'll have some tabling events there and hope to see you there. I also want to thank our endowment committee members and also our Conservation Science Committee for their ongoing excellent work. Our endowment is increasing and our committee members for conservation science are just doing a ton of great advocacy and writing really excellent letters to city officials and agencies, which is protecting birds. So thank you for that. Our Meet Your Wild Neighbor Elementary School Outreach Program is resuming in person this spring. So we're thrilled that COVID is um, getting better and that we can be back in our schools. And also our Santa Barbara Audubon Society annual winter bird count for kids will happen on April 9th. It's gonna be on a bird in a bird on your own format. And please contact Dottie Pack if you have questions and want directions about where to pick up your free t-shirt or bird checklist. It will be free for the first 80 kids who show up. And thank you to Judy Blue and Joan Cottage for leading this as always. And last but not least, thank you, Aaron and Emily for setting up tonight's program. I muted myself successfully. Um, thank you, Catherine. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speaker tonight. Um, our speaker is Kristen Hislop, the Senior Director of the Marine Program at the Environmental Defense Center. Um, Kristen works on issues ranging from offshore energy development to marine protected areas to marine shipping. Kristen earned her BA in Geography from UCSB and her Master's of Environmental Science and Management with an emphasis in Coastal and Marine Management from the Bren School at UCSB where I presently am, so some hope that I can find a future after grad school. While studying at the Bren School, Kristen worked for EC as an environmental advocacy intern, conducting research on the environmental impacts of oil rigs in the Santa Barbara Channel. Kristen enjoys hiking Santa Barbara trails, paddling along our coast, and exploring the Channel Islands. I recall correctly, she also serves on the Channel Islands National, the Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council as the conservation um, representative. So an environmental superstar with us tonight. Um, with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Kristen, who will be talking about proposed offshore wind energy developments along the Central Coast. So, and I'm driving the slideshow, so bear with me for a second as I share my screen. Thank you, Aaron. Okay. Um, yeah, Aaron mentioned he's going to share his screen. So I will um, first thank thank Aaron and Emily for inviting me to come speak on this issue as I I keep describing it's a very um interesting issue because it just overlaps so many different resource management um issues in the in the region it involves just about every state and federal agency you can imagine and it has a lot of attention from 
conservation groups like the Environmental Defense Center, or as I will refer to us, um, EDC, along with uh, lots of other groups, National Audubon Society being um, one of the groups I've worked most closely with, uh, along with Natural Resources Defense Council and um, Center for Biological Diversity, Monterey Bay Aquarium and others. So we have a very um, large and um, engaged community working on responding to these proposals for offshore wind. So I'm going to give you an overview of the webinar, or not webinar, the talk that if we were all in a room, we would be a lot more casual than um, a webinar, but I'll give you an overview of what I hope to share today. And then um, yeah, I can't wait to have a discussion at the end. So this talk is really meant to be an introduction to offshore wind and what potential projects may mean for the Central Coast. Um, I am definitely focused on big picture issues, where we are with offshore wind development, what we can expect to see uh, in the future, what's kind of happening in the moment. And I'm probably gonna be a little less able to provide answers to very bird specific questions that I'm sure you intelligent and excited people may have for me, but I will do my best if there's anything um, specific. And if not, I will recruit the um, expertise of our friends at the National Audubon Society, um, namely Gary George, who I've been working with very closely on this issue. Um, so setting the expectations for, for the conversation here. So before I even dive in all, I wanna define what offshore wind is. And it's essentially just wind projects or wind farms that are in the ocean off of our coast. And when we talk about projects coming online in California, we're talking about the very first offshore wind projects on the West Coast. So while there may be projects on the East Coast and in Europe and other areas, this is very new for California. Um, we are specifically also talking about floating offshore wind, which is also new technology. There's um, a few projects globally that are looking at floating offshore wind, but uh, there has yet to be a, a, you know, a larger project that we can really glean a lot of information from. So it's new technology. Uh, so in this webinar, I will introduce you to what offshore wind looks like in, off the California coast, a background on why EDC and other environmental nonprofit groups are involved, the various environmental issues, and the proposed projects. So we can move to the next slide. Okay, so what does offshore wind look like off the coast of California? So I, as I mentioned, there's a lot of projects globally, and many of those, if not a vast majority, almost all, look like the three turbines you see on the left. So those three turbines are stationary. They are actually pile driven into the ground, into the seafloor. And so a lot of the impacts to those um, projects are actually in the development stage. So when these, when these um, technologies are actually being put in the ocean. But uh, unlike other areas, um, California, the continental shelf drops off very rapidly. So any offshore wind development will need to be in very deep water. So because of that fact, we're talking about floating wind, with, which is this new technology. Um, the first floating wind farm began operating in 2017 in Scotland. And that wind farm is in about 120 meters of water. But off the California coast, we are considering projects in depths up to 3,000 feet. So there's a pretty big difference in projects um, that are already in the works and what we are gonna be looking at here. So as you can see in this photo on the right, floating wind is connected via an array of cables that are anchoring these turbines in place. So there's various uh, designs that we may be looking at. You can see three different designs here, but the thing they all have in common, aside from the, <laughs> the kind of the shape of the turbine is the fact that they all have to be uh, connected to the seafloor in some way. And so this is gonna be an array of cables. And when we say cables, we're really talking about chains that have links the size of houses or cars. They're huge. Um, I think the, so the links are, I've been heard described as the size of a house, um, but the anchors that will hold these things to the seafloor, uh, I'm sorry, the size of a car, but the anchors would be the size of a house. So these things are, are when we say cables, it sounds tiny and quaint, but they're actually quite, quite large. Um, so an, an additional change from other wind farms that you may know, know of, if you've driven out to the desert or seen wind turbines on land, those seem massive in scale compared to what they used to be. Um, I don't know if any of you have dr driven over the Altamont up in Northern California, but those little uh, wind turbines that we saw back um, 
developed, you know, decades ago uh, are are dwarfed by these new uh, wind turbines on land. But keep that keeping in mind that the wind turbines on land are about five megawatts each. These in the ocean are going to be 10 to 12 is what's being proposed right now, but upwards of 15 megawatts. So um, some estimates put these turbines at 700 feet tall with blades more than 100 meters in length. So each of these blades would be the length of a football field. These things are going to be huge. They're described as the size of the Empire State Building. So these are, are different types of technology that we see on land. Um, so one estimate, just I know size, size is interesting to hear, but what, how much energy are these going to provide? So an estimate from General Electric for a 14 megawatt turbine uh, basically says that one rotation could power one household for two days. So these things do have the potential to really provide a lot of energy. Um, but okay, because these are, this is new technology, it's in a new location with new depths, there's a lot of unknowns. And so there are a lot of questions that the industry, independent researchers, government agencies are still trying to answer. And that's why so many environmental groups are working on this issue to make sure we account for as many possible impacts as we can and support robust planning to avoid as many negative environmental and community impacts as possible. And we'll talk more about that but we'll go on to the next slide. So it's hard to talk about um, enthusiasm or interest in industrializing the ocean in such a way that would have Empire State size building turbines without prefacing this with the fact that we are looking at this because of the current climate crisis, which I know everyone is aware of. And yeah, I'm still gonna dig into it a little bit because we, we do have to, to talk about the big, the big picture here. So being from Santa Barbara, we all know too well the impacts from fossil fuels. We've experienced multiple oil spills. As you can see, that's the 1969 spill on the left-hand side. Um, but we're also dealing with the realities of the climate crisis right now. We are dealing with sea level rise. We have more extreme fires that have led to debris flows. We have ocean acidification and warmer oceans that are leading to species die off. So our lack of kelp in California um, is related to warm water. Um, many of you may have heard it referred to as the blob in um, 2016 that kind of wiped out a lot of our, our keystone uh, species in California. So we join our communities, um, city of Santa Barbara and others, um, our state, and luckily now under the Biden administration, um, our nation in supporting aggressive renewable energy goals. And renewable energy is going to come from a wide variety of sources, including rooftop solar, um, large wind projects, uh, desert solar. So every industrial or really large scale project will come with environmental impacts and trade-offs, whether we're talking about you know, the big solar projects you see in the desert or those 700 foot tall wind turbines that we're talking about 20 miles offshore. So, EDC's position, and we, we share this with many of our colleagues, is that we support renewable energy um, enthusiastically, but we maintain our role as environmental advocates to ensure that localized impacts to species and other user groups are avoided when possible. And we do believe this can be accomplished with careful planning and siting of renewable projects. Um, and when it comes to offshore wind, that's what we have been pushing for for the last six years. We got involved early to support a smooth transition to renewable offshore wind by working with elected officials and industry and partners in the environmental community, um, including National Audubon Society. And um, whether we will be successful in this is yet to be seen. Um, there's a lot of decisions that have been made about siting that were heavily driven by uh, military needs and not necessarily uh, stakeholder input on where we wanna see these. So um, that is kind of where we are at this time. Slide four, please. Okay, so here's a, a good old fashioned list of environmental considerations. So we know we need a strong focus on avoiding and then minimizing and as a last resort mitigating for environmental impacts. And those are some of the ones you see here. So I'm going to start with collisions uh, appropriately first in line for a group full of bird enthusiast enthusiasts. Um, but something you are likely all aware of is on land and in the ocean birds are impacted by colliding and bats are by colliding with the blades of turbines. So 
some people look at these really large turbines and wonder how a bird could be impacted by them, but actually the speed of the tips of these go very, very, very fast. Um, so they are impacted, even though they look like they're moving slower. Um, so how do we deal with this issue? First, we have to prioritize the avoidance of areas with high abundance of birds and bats. So um, we'll, get, we'll get into kind of the marine spatial planning later, but that's a, a top priority is figuring out where we can put these that would have least impact. One of those um, solutions being farther offshore because close to shore, we have um, a lot of species with what we call near shore affinity. Um, so in my, I know you all are very focused on birds here, of course. So in my word with, work with National Audubon Society, I understand that their efforts in the offshore wind space are largely driven by a recent study that you may have all heard of um, that estimates about two thirds of North American birds are at increasing risk of extinction from global temperature change. So despite the inevitable impacts that turbines will have on birds, both from collisions and displacement, so moving for, like birds avoiding the area and thus um, not necessarily being where they need to be for migration and feeding, um, despite those impacts, it's felt that the continuing use of fossil fuel will have far riskier outcomes. So there is um, an interest in offshore wind because of that. So I just wanted to, to preface that, that um, in all of our work, we, we work very closely with the energy team at National Audubon Society to make sure that we're really getting the expertise of, um, of that organization for all things birds. So we can't completely avoid interactions with birds. So we need to build in requirements for wind companies to monitor so we can understand the impacts, um, mitigate for some of those impacts and um, adapt operations as we can. Um, so the next issue is entanglement. And this is very important in our region. So we are talking about secondary entanglement. So you saw that array of cables that will be holding these turbines in place. Um, someone described this array to me as a, a web, a spider web underwater, which it's a very, very large spider web with lots of gaps between, but it does paint an interesting picture. Um, you know, things get caught in webs, essentially. So we are concerned that there may be some direct impact with uh, marine mammals, like lunge, lunge feeding whales and these large uh, anchor chains or cables. But we imagine the bigger threat being derelict or ghost fishing nets and lines that might get tangled on the cables and then animals get tangled in those. So that's really what we're talking about um, when we're referring to secondary entanglement. And entanglement can impact all types of animals. We are primarily concerned with marine, ma marine mammals and sea turtles because of their uh, declining numbers or, or low numbers. Some of them are recovering. Um, and the Central Coast hosts a variety of endangered and threatened whales, and we want to ensure that wind farms do not negatively impact those recovering populations. So then we also have noise, which it will be a little bit different than our um, stationary <laughs> counterparts on the west or the east coast, where they aren't floating, they're actually pile driven into the ground. So those shallow projects um, are very loud at, all, at um, the construction phase and have significant impact noise impacts from marine mammals. But luckily we're told that floating wind doesn't have that same impact because they, the method of attaching these structures to the seafloor is different. It's by anchoring them, not by driving them into the ground. So there's less construction noise, but there will still be noise impacts from construction and normal operations, which can affect marine mammals, fishes, and other species. So um, luckily, hopefully that, that impact is a little bit less than in the stationary projects. And then displacement, I mentioned briefly, um, this could be because of noise or the physical structures and the cable arrays themselves. And so the question is, will marine species avoid the area? Will that then push them into other areas of risk? For example, um, if whales avoid this area because they just don't want to traverse the, the web of um, cables, will they be pushed into a location with higher vessel traffic or bring them closer to the coast or, um, you know, just move them away from areas where they should be able to feed. So that's a concern. Um, and that leads us to the next issue of ship strike. So another very big concern of recovering whale populations on the California coast is being struck by large vessels. We see them coming through the Santa Barbara Channel quite often, and they do on occasion strike and kill whales. So if we're displacing whales into areas with ship traffic, or if there's increased ship traffic to um, work on these areas uh, of the wind farms, will that actually increase the likelihood of ship strikes? 
Um, so one thing we can do to avoid that is to ensure ships are going at proper speeds to avoid hitting whales. And if they do hit them, um, avoid or minimize the risk of killing them. So then we also have habitat impacts and that can be scour from the anchor chain or the cable array. So you can imagine these things uh, are moving in the ocean column and can scour the seafloor. Um, and they can potentially impact habitats such as deep sea corals, uh, among many, many others. So we're concerned about benthic habitat. And then finally, it's something we don't always talk about um, or we don't always hear about when we're talking about offshore projects is the onshore development. So um, these are gonna be really large industrial projects and I'll describe the, the, <laughs> the size of them shortly. But um, the, the turbines themselves are so large, they need to be constructed near the wind farm. Um, they're too big to be transported on land. Can you imagine um, seeing a, a blade the size of a, a football field coming down the highway? It's just too, it's too large to move, move by those means. So this means they need to be constructed at large ports that already have the capacity for such projects or new facilities need to be built on shore to complete construction. And these would be large, um, large projects in and of themselves. So this could have impacts on coastal ecosystems, um, but may also change the character of coastal towns that agree to host such de development. So it may change the, the harbor, working harbors from um, you know, fishing to this new industrial use or um, just add on to it. So that's a, that could be a potentially large change on the central coast. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here's where I get to talk about the current proposals. So conversation started in 2016 when a wind company basically requested to lease an area off the coast of Morro Bay. Um, and any private company that wants public land or sea space has to get a lease from the government. So this started a process at the federal level to identify suitable sea space for offshore wind. And the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is the responsible agency. And in response to that lease request, the agency sent out a call for competitive interest or in simple terms, terms asked other wind companies to speak up if they were also interested in leasing the same sea space for offshore wind. And because multiple companies said they were interested, that led to a process where the Bureau created uh, some things called call areas or places they thought may be optimal for offshore wind. Um, that has since turned into the wind energy area. We are, we are now in a space where we have um, this blue polygon you see is the, the area that the Bureau has decided is going to be likely available for lease auction in this year, probably this fall. So they recently had public comment on this and um, we expect to see environmental review and lease auction for wind in this area. So things are moving along. Um, from what we've heard, this is likely the only place along the central coast in federal waters um, for wind projects. There, we'll talk about state waters in a moment, but federal waters are three nautical miles and, and beyond to 200 miles that um, would be leased by the federal government. So because I think mostly a, a military complex, this is likely the only area that we will see developed, though that is, of course, yet to be seen and will develop over the next many decades. So we don't know that for a fact. Next slide. Okay, so I thought this was an interesting slide and keep in mind that this image is meant to be the size of a wall. Um, this is a rendering from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management on what the visibility of these turbines would be from shore. And this is from a point east of P the Piedras Blancas Lighthouse. And so when, when the Bureau started um, looking at community meetings to um, show folks what these projects would look like, they created these, this rendering. You can see the orange circle is um, around what would be a turbine in the proposed area. I think a 10 megawatt turbine. Um, and you can see maybe, depending on what screen you're looking at right now, that these, uh, these wind turbines look about like the third of the size of that lighthouse there, but pretty small on a cloudy day, you can't see them, but on a clear day, you can. Um, and again, this was intended to be presented at a public meeting and this would have been printed on a wall. So it's very hard to get the scale on a tablet or your computer, but I do think it's a really interesting image and you can um, expand it in your mind to see that, yes, they will be visible 
but they um, aren't maybe as obtrusive as some people might think because they are pretty far offshore. Um, so that's kind of the main point. They won't be visible. Um, but, you know, EDC and a lot of our other environmental groups are less interested in the visual impacts as the other environmental impacts. Um, but that being said, it's very important to the California coastline. Um, the Coastal Commission will obviously have to weigh in on the visual impacts, but I will leave it to you all to decide whether these are obtrusive structures um, and a blight on the horizon or beautiful reminders that we're tackling the climate crisis. Okay, next slide. Okay, that brings us to the other projects that have been proposed in our region in state waters. So there are two proposed projects off the coast between Vandenberg Air Force Base and Point Conception. So this is Point Arguello, um, which is where they are directly um, west of. So you can kind of see that, that blue arrow to the right of it or to the east of that blue arrow is, is Point Arguello. Um, these arrows point to two distinct projects which each are proposed to have four turbines. And this, they're in the, the early stages of permitting. Um, essentially, the State Lands Commission has agreed to allow these two companies to move forward with an EIR, an environmental impact report on um, leasing these areas. And um, EDC and, and our coalition of partnering environmental groups, including Audubon, are very concerned about these projects because they are really close to shore and many species in this area have near shore affinity. This is an area that also has many special designations. Um, it's an important bird area for many, uh, many species, including Swedish shearwater. It's critical habitat for many species as well, such as humpback whale and leatherback sea turtle. And it's a biologically important area for blue and gray whales. So, um, it's also in the proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, and it borders the Point Conception Marine Protected Area. So it's just in a really important biological area for, for many, many species and habitats. Um, we are generally concerned about any projects in state waters because of that uh, near shore affinity issue with many species. And we do want to see projects further offshore. Um, there's very no projects actually yet in, in the United States have approved have been approved in state waters. Uh, there's, I think the closest project to shore is something like nine miles. So um, just some something to chew on. But that's the other the other projects that we are looking at. Next slide. Okay, so moving forward, we are working hard to push for a statewide planning process that first identifies the optimal location for offshore wind, which we may have um, passed by because now we have some um, wind energy areas that were decided, as I mentioned earlier, um, not with a ton of stakeholder input, though there was some. Um, so we, we, we still are asking for that um, from the state, especially. We want to, um, we don't want to be constantly responding to industry requests for projects. We believe that planning can result in benefits to both industry and definitely the environment. We're moving forward in good faith um, with the understanding that we're, we're all on the same side and with the goal of advancing renewable energy. And, and we, meaning the environmental groups that I've been working with, do believe the offshore wind can play a role in that. But if we are responding to poorly cited projects, we're wasting valuable time and energy that will slow the transition to renewables. Um, we want to avoid lawsuits and um, issues that could be resolved collaboratively um, early in the process. So, so that's just one thing we've been pushing for for the last six years. Uh, we do support recommendations that came out of a joint agency report on how to best get to 100% renewables, and that is listed here. So basically, we're saying that planning can lead to address barriers to development, improve agency coordination, increase transparency and multi-stakeholder input, increase collaboration, including between environmental NGOs and the industry, avoid environmental impacts, and move us towards 100% renewable in the most efficient manner. So um, in some ways, this train has left the station for the, the Morro Bay project, and the, there's a similar project up in Humboldt, which I haven't mentioned, but um, that's the other area off the California coast where we're looking at wind and federal waters right now. But we are still working very hard with the state to ensure that um, this kind of planning process work, moves forward. And in that 
in that light, we have a le legislation that was passed last year called AB 525 that requires a planning process um, from the state. So we're working closely with many of the state agencies, the Energy Commission, the Ocean Protection Council, Coastal Commission, to look at how to best um, plan for offshore wind on a statewide basis. Um, and again, instead of responding to industry requests um, in a consistent manner. So we are optimistic that we're gonna make strides and that legislation will help. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I just wanna end by saying that California's coastline, as you all know, <laughs> living in Santa Barbara, is beloved for many reasons that have to do with the beauty of our coastline and the richness of our marine ecosystems and our abundant coastal dependent tourism opportunities. Um, and we recognize that communities in the Santa Barbara Channel region and Southern California have already borne significant impacts from offshore oil development. And we want to ensure that offshore wind provides us with the opportunity to rely on renewable energy without devastating environmental consequences. So we're working really hard to accomplish that and um, really relying on you know, communication with other groups and the community and hearing what you all have to think about this issue. So um, I'm excited to open up the conversation and hear what you all have to, to say and what you all think about this. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Looks like David actually had a question, so I'll read that one first. Uh, yeah. What is the lifespan of these wind generators, and what is the plan for end-of-life disposal slash recycle? And this would probably be a, I know we're wind energy focused, but probably would be a, could talk about some <laughs> oil rigs there too, probably. Yeah, um, I think the wind, the, the wind span, the lifespan is in the 30-year range. Um, don't quote me on that. I I have that number in my head, but I can't remember where I heard that. The plan for end of life disposal recycle is um, up in the air because we haven't had act projects actually be proposed. So we don't know what the industry is going to propose for that yet. But we've been told over and over again that because these are floating, they're super easy to remove. Of course, um, that's to be to be seen. We have to remove the anchor chain and the, and the anchors themselves and all that too. Um, and then disposal, I know that some of these are difficult to recycle. I just read an article actually about how um, some of the blades that are already being uh, decommissioned are being used for bridges and other, um, other uses because they are very difficult to recycle, but they're very strong so they can be reused. Um, so all of that's still to be, to be seen depending on what the agreements are with the construction and operations plan. Thanks. And then Catherine mentioned the fabulous talk. And I know if no other questions come in, I know Emily is usually pretty good at having questions. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, the initial slide that was showing the project um, potentially off in federal waters near Morro Bay, it seemed like there was going to be like a bid to, to lease it. But is that, you know, they bid to lease that area and then there's an environmental review. So it's not like already known that that's a key spot to put it. I guess I was just thinking about like the location of it, you know, the people bidding on it, they even know that that's like an ideal spot. Uh, yeah. So, so because the, um, that area was determined because a company requested to lease it, that company had done the research to know it's it's a good wind energy area, so it has a lot of um, it has a lot of wind. That being said, um, we still need to see an environmental review as to what the impacts of that leasing decision will be. And what we've been really pushing for is similar to what the oil and gas program is, which is a programmatic environmental impact statement, which um, basically doesn't just look at that one area, but looks at the entire California coast and determines what the cumulative impacts would be of the various leasing areas. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, we don't have all the information that we would like to have had to know that that's the optimal place for wind, not only for wind resources, that's pretty easy to, to look at, but just the, the impacts and the trade-off analysis and everything that was that was done by the industry and by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management in their own way, but it wasn't as um, stakeholder driven as we would like to see. 
And so from there, now that there is a wind energy area, what we understand will happen is that um, after they're going to do some environmental review on that lease area, and then after that, there will be the opportunity for multiple leases within that region. And they're going to look at, um, at that point, where they could actually put the wind within that area um, with you know, minimal impacts to the marine environment. So what we were really trying to get at was the, a larger lease area, which seems a little bit scary, but actually then you can winnow it down to be where you really wanna see it um, be accomplished. But the amount of wind that they want to see in this area, there's not gonna be a, a whole lot of room for um, <laughs> leaving places blank. So, um, so there will be multiple leases, multiple companies that then get to use this area to produce wind energy. And um, also wanting to mention just the size of this. So that area is called the 399 because it's 399 square miles. So it's very large. And the goal that was set out in um, the joint report that we meant that I mentioned earlier is that offshore wind could accomplish 10 gigawatts of energy for the state of California, which would require 1,100 square miles. So this is a really large amount of sea space. Um, and we don't know where all of that 1,100 square miles could go. So uh, the expectation is that approximately 400 square miles would be down in central California, which doesn't leave a lot of room to actually decide where within that call area the projects go. Um, so a lot of this is yet to be seen. We, you know, we need to get through the environmental review, but those are all kind of issues that we're talking about and, and, and thinking about and a little bit worried about. <laughs> that probably sets us up nice for Terry's question, which is um, in the future about addressing the issue of take permits for marine and avian species. So, I mean, I imagine some of that connects to kind of federal listing and state listed status. So if you could touch on that a bit. Yeah. Um, so, Again, that will depend on um, who, you know, wh which areas are being being permitted and how many uh, projects there are and whatnot. But um, I don't, I, I obviously take permits. Well, there's plenty of species in this area that could be impacted. Um, we, ha I haven't taken a deep dive into what that exactly is going to look like, but it would be similar to other projects. So it would be similar to oil and gas or um, other projects in the ocean. And then Barbara had a more specific question on the name of the company who wants the lease and where they're located. Um, so the original company that um, that submitted this, what is called an unsolicited lease requ request, was called Trident Wind. They have since changed names or ownership or <laughs> I'm not sure. But now there's a whole slew of companies that are interested from all over the world. And one of the interesting things is that a lot of these companies are oil companies that are moving into the renewable energy um, sector. And one of the frustrations I have is, um, you know, a discussion about the, the need to move quickly on these projects, which we under, all understand. We need to transition to renewables as quickly as possible. But when you have an oil company <laughs> telling you that they, they want to skip through environmental review and get permits as fast as possible because of the climate crisis, it's a little bit frustrating. Um, so I like to really take the, the um, angle of we need to do this right. We, we do need to move quickly, but that's why we've been really trying to get um, the, all of the players to understand what needs to be accomplished early on in the process. And again, I've been working on this for six years and we, I feel like we haven't quite even gotten to the point where everyone's um, talking about what we need to do to, to make this move. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a frustrating process. Uh, a lot, most of these are foreign companies, um, many from Europe, but um, again, there's, there's a lot of them. I don't even know who's gonna be bidding on, on these lease areas. Yeah, on that note, I mean, obviously a different kind of wind energy, but with the Strauss project up in Lompoc, which is currently going in, that's a German company. So mm -hmm. not wind or not offshore, but for context. Yeah. These are large, large uh, multi 
national companies for the most part. Some are small. There are some that I've been working with for many years that are um, much smaller uh, and and domestic. But um, you know, who knows who's going to win the win the bid for the lease? So. Mm -hmm. I guess I had a question as far as uh, permitting requirements is, uh, would there be like mitigation uh, protocol as part of the permit where they'd have to like improve habitat somewhere else as like one of the requirements? Yeah, there, there, I mean, one thing we're really pushing for is um, of course avoidance, which is not gonna be possible for everything. And then minimization through monitoring um, and technology to minimize impacts. But then, yes, there will be mitigation, and we're going to be pushing pretty hard for um, that <laughs> in general, just to make sure that we get as much as we can for whatever impacts um, come up. And again, a lot of these impacts are uh, unknown because this is just an, a new, a new technology in a new place. So, but yeah, we'll be working really hard to to get mitigation. Yeah, then that was. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and the company is. At, at, as of now, you know, we work very closely with a lot of these um, companies and work well with them. And the, the folks that I work with, I have a lot of respect for. Um, they have voiced that they're very interested in mitigation as well and want to know what we want. So we're working on kind of our wish list. <laughs> so if you all have ideas, please do let us know. Then there was a quick question about the North Sea projects, I think, in Europe about whether those are anchored or floating. Um, the Scotland project um, was is floating. Um, most of the projects in Europe are, are anchored. So, um, but they're they are starting to do floating as well. Those are smaller, like one to two turbine kind of test projects. But there's a larger one um, going in now. So we, you know, we do have a little bit of information because of that. But they again, they are in different depths than we will be dealing with. Yeah, and then there was another question about kind of the international versus U.S. company dynamic, and I think um, you kind of touched on it a little bit. But. Yeah, I think the leases, this is not my expertise, but I believe um, that the leases, it's basically who bids the most, um, so who offers the, the best deal out of the government, essentially. We have a lot of international groups drilling for oil, so. Mm. Oh, and then I guess one question you probably were thinking this too, Emily, uh, maybe just a quick elaboration about kind of where the proposed um, marine sanctuary plays in this. Cause I oh, yeah. Um, I think that's a really interesting piece of the puzzle. So the proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, for those of you who don't know, would essentially um, uh, cover the coastline between Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and the Channel Islands. So uh, it wouldn't come all the way into the Santa Barbara Channel, but it would overlap with the um, two state projects um, that are proposed off of Vandenberg and Point Conception, Point Arguello. Um, and interestingly, the, the boundary for that sanctuary was changed to accommodate this Morro Bay 399 because um, the agencies want to play nice to get this moving. Uh, there's a strong preference from the state and the federal government to get this offshore wind in the water to meet our renewable energy goals. So because of that, there was a, a change to the designation document um, that allows for offshore wind in that Morro Bay area. That being said, any new development, um, there's no current mechanism to allow for offshore wind within sanctuary waters. So unless the designation document change that um, precedent and allowed for it, the area of the Chumash heritage would essentially become a sanctuary from wind as well. So I think that there's a lot of folks that are interested in that because then it reduces the, the footprint of wind in areas that um, are concerning to those of us who are worried about environmental impacts, also the military, so um, yeah, that's a very interesting overlapping uh, topic. Um, Terry and Tony are asking, is there much information about the environmental impacts of the North Sea projects? 
Yeah, so there is um, information, but unfortunately, there are not very strong monitoring requirements for these projects. So we don't have as much information as we would want to. Um, so on impacts about collision, um, I, I think like the entanglement questions are very different on the West Coast because uh, we just have different species and we're talking about a different area. But that is one of the disappointing things I've heard. Um, but yes, there is information that we can learn from for sure. So we're not just going into this thing blind and we, the industry definitely feels like they have a lot of information to use um, so that we can avoid doing test projects, even though many of us, when we started all this, really wanted to see some small projects first so that we could analyze the impacts. But again, um, we are now in a, a different reality where we have the Morro Bay 399 area that's that's on a fast track to, to moving forward. Um, but I will say that even though the leases are going to be um, probably complete this fall, development is going to take many years. So we're not going to see these for, you know, five to 10 years. So there's, there's definitely time for us to still learn from other areas. Yeah, and I guess that brings up one other question I had. You kind of touched on it with the onshore development, I know, and we kind of, you mentioned it briefly, the Humboldt projects. I mean, so it would mainly kind of be like Morro Bay and Arcata would be two communities that would be kind of facing <laughs> some onshore development. Yeah, so for the, for the more, to get, I mean, it's interesting because Humboldt is more interested in seeing um, port development than maybe we are down here because they are excited about the economic benefit from it. Um, for us to have turbines being developed and built, we have to look to existing ports, which would be um, Port of LA Long Beach or Port Wainimi. And we've heard Port Wainimi is pretty much full. They don't have the capacity to um, accommodate this use. I mean, who knows, maybe that will change, but that's what we've been told. Um, we can't lean on San Francisco Bay Area because uh, the ports within the Bay, um, while they might be able to accommodate a big use that we can't get the turbines out of the Bay. So <laughs> that's not a possibility. And then bringing them down from Humboldt, if we do build a port up in Humboldt, well, that provides its own um, challenges. It's just really far. So there's the potential that there will be uh, proposals to create a new port, maybe in the Morro Bay area, which is very concerning to me. Um, that's a really big new use of the coastline in an area that's pretty undeveloped. So um, yeah, that's, that's definitely of concern. Yeah, thanks. Um... Yeah, I think you answered all my questions because I was <laughs> kind of curious, you know, aside from like what the permits involved, um, I already asked about like mitigation being part of it, but yeah, same thing, just like, are there any, you know, enough studies to already have an answer or if, if monitoring would be something that would be like built into like um, the environmental impact report to, to have a certain amount of monitoring required. Yeah, I think the monitoring is going to be really a big, um, a big push, uh, especially from our bird colleagues. So having the capacity to know what's happening out there, um, to know if we can, I mean, you know, we talk about adaptive management and even though these things are floating, they're not going to be moved. So, um, but does that mean they can be slowed down through certain times of the year? Can they be stopped? If there's a migration happening, are there things we can do to actively manage these projects to avoid impacts to birds? We'll, we need to have really good monitoring for that. So we're gonna need to lean on all the existing technologies and potentially new technologies. Um, but a lot of that's being researched right now and, and looked into. So I feel confident that we can get there. Um, we just have to, you know, really keep pushing for it. But um, I, I, again, I do feel confident that that there's a lot of innovation that we can do to really monitor these things. Yeah, I think there was one more question just about some of the, and I mean, it sounds like it's one of these tricky things where some of the process is far along and some of the process still has quite a bit down the line to happen. Yeah. I know that, that can be challenging to provide answers when you're in that sort of midterm, but kind of Another question about kind of the costs of the project and then the impacts to Morro Bay. And I think you kind of touched on that part already. So 
Yeah. I don't, I don't know the cost. Um, I can't even give you a, an estimate on that, but I can say that the job creation is being touted as um, pretty important that I think it's mostly in the construction. So it'll be a good boon in the construction. Um, will it be local jobs? I don't know. Cause it's going to need to be people who know um, the industry. So not sure about answering those questions. So it's definitely being, um, you know, touted as, as a, a big plus, which it, it will, it will provide jobs. I just don't know that they're, they seem temporary. And from what I understand, um, and how many years of disruption in Morro Bay, uh, you know, I, if there's a port, then that's forever, right? We're going to have a port forever and that's going to be a, a permanent disruption. Um, but in terms of construction, I think it's on the, you know, few years time scale, maybe two to five years, something like that. And then of course operations, um, forever, but I, it's my understanding that the operations are limited to the transmission facility. So these, well, basically one of the reasons, which I failed to mention, one of the reasons that this area was so attractive to industry and to the, to the government is because we have the Morro Bay power plant being decommissioned and the Diablo Canyon power plant being decommissioned. So we already have six gigawatts of transmission capacity that A, we need to fill and B, is available. So that's why Morro Bay was chosen. Um, so we are, at least we already have that facility and that, that transmission. So that's good in terms of disruption. That's a, you know, a continuing use, but it's not a new, um, new disruption to the community. Um, and then I think operations in general, it's, you know, boat trips out to, to, um, maintain the platforms or the turbines. And, um, I don't know that it's going to be that disruptive on a long-term scale, aside from the the construction that is done on shore to accommodate these things. And, you know, there's going to be decommissioning and if they're successful, then they're going to be rebuilding them. And so, you know, if these things do what we hope that they do, which is provide renewable energy at a, that we are happy with. And we, and after 30 years, we want to see continue then, you know, those, those construction operations will be in a cycle, an ongoing cycle. Awesome. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in. So unless anybody else has anything, um, I think we'll probably wrap it up there. But um, thank you, Kristen, for the time and the informative presentation and definitely something for everybody to kind of keep track of going forward. Because Yeah. And um, I'll put my email in the chat if anyone has questions or just wants to chat about this. Or honestly, I'm really interested to hear what you all think about these because you know we've had we've had some folks call us at very concerned about um these projects and um edc's interest and in, <clears throat> excuse me interest in in moving forward with renewable energy with this renewable energy but i i do hope that i've um, painted a, a cautionary approach here we are enthusiastic about the possibility but we, we still have a lot of concerns um so you know i'd love to to chat with anyone who's interested in in sharing their thoughts on this and and um, and potentially just having a greater conversation about it. So uh, my email's there and please feel free to use it. Awesome. Well, I know we, I thank you for talking about all that. And at some point we'll get you back and we'll turn off the recording and get your real, <laughs> your real thoughts. But no, that was really awesome and informative. So we definitely appreciate it. And um, yeah, we definitely appreciate all the work EDC does with the environment locally. So. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. All right. Well, with that, I think we'll go ahead and call it an evening. I'll just really quickly mention that this is available for viewing on Santa Barbara Audubon org after um, or on YouTube, I guess. And then our next program is on March 23rd. We'll have Holly Merker talking about ornotherapy. So birding as a way for mental health. Oh. Yeah, but thank you and have a good night, everybody. And have a good rest of the week. See you next month.